During this course, you have previously learned that the immature stages, the eggs, larvae and pupae of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are found in a variety of water holding containers in or around houses. You have also learned that entomological surveys of Aedes aegypti are important to determine the effect of control measures on mosquito populations and or to study epidemiology of effectborne disease. Historically, surveillance of Aedes mosquitoes has relied more heavily on estimating the population densities of the immature stages rather than the adults. This is because it was comparatively harder to collect Aedes aegypti adults than immatures due to their activity during the day and their tendency to rest and feed outdoors. However, as you have heard in the previous step, Trapping and collection methods for capturing adult Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are becoming more widely available and they provide better data for quantifying transmission risks than larval counting. Nevertheless, obtaining densities of immature stages still has operational value because they are used to study the local vector ecology and to measure the impact of vector control interventions aimed to reduce container breeding. In theory, it should be relatively easy to count larvae, but as you can see from this slide shown photos taken in Puerto Rico, the variety and the limited access of many natural breeding sites poses challenges. You can find immature stages of Aedes in small temporary containers such as rain-filled plants, discarded items and tires, as well as more permanent containers such as water meters and oil drums. Therefore, obtaining reliable estimates requires thorough searching. So what does a breeding site with Aedes larvae look like and how do I count the larvae? You need to examine all containers with water present. If there is larvae in the water, the first thing that you will notice is movement. So inspect these containers more carefully. The larvae will move up to the surface of the water to breathe and will then move down to the bottom to feed. You can see Aedes larvae at the surface of the water on the photograph on the left. The round structure at one end of the body is their head and the pointed structure at the other end is the siphon. The siphon allows them to penetrate the surface of the water and to respire. There is no standard equipment for sampling the larvae, but for large containers a dipper as shown in the photograph on the right or a net may be used. But for small containers, the entire contents are emptied onto a tray and the immature stages are picked out using a pipette. If necessary, the samples can be stored in vials, labelled with details relating to their date of collection and sampling site, and then taken back to the laboratory for species identification. And you will find out more about how to prepare your samples later in the course. Larval surveys involve identifying all or most of the immature mosquitoes found in every container or representative sample of containers in the target area. The traditional indices used to study the impact of vector interventions are the house index, which is the percentage of houses, including the surrounding compound, that have larvae of Aedes aegypti in at least some of the containers. The container index is the percentage of water holding containers examined that contain larvae of Aedes aegypti. The Bretto index is the total number of containers with larvae of Aedes aegypti in 100 houses being sampled. The larval density index, which is the mean number of Aedes aegypti per house, is used less often because it is laborious as it requires counting all of the larvae present in each container. The WHO produced a table to compare larval densities throughout the world in order to identify population sizes of Aedes aegypti, which represent a threat of urban transmission of yellow fever. For dengue, a house index of greater than 10% or a Bretto index of greater than 50 is considered a high risk of transmission, whereas a house index of less than 1% or a Bretto index of less than five is considered low risk. No estimates have been proposed for Zika. Note that these figures need to be considered very cautiously. The limitations of these indices are that productivity of containers varies greatly over time, 
and larval density cannot be used to predict adult numbers. Therefore, traditional larval indices have limited use for assessing transmission risk. However, larval indices are useful for identifying whether certain containers pose more risk of harbouring larvae than others, and this means that operational programmes focusing on containers, either by treating them with insecticides or removing them from an environment, can be more targeted. Pupil surveys, where the number of pupae per person is calculated, provide a better proxy in larvae for use in risk thresholds. Pupil surveys normally require a pair of collectors sampling all of the water fill containers in and around 100 or more houses, having previously obtained informed consent from the householders. The water is sieved and the pupae are counted. If there are several container breeding species in the area, it cannot be assumed that all pupae present are Aegis aegypti. Therefore, the larvae need to be placed in vials and returned to the laboratory where they can emerge as adults for species identification. So why count pupae? So in contrast to the other life stages, it is possible to determine the absolute number of Aegis aegypti pupae in most domestic environments. Secondly, because pupal mortality is low, there is a good correlation between the number of pupae and the number of adults. The counts of eggs or larvae are poor proxies because there is more mortality and the costs are prohibitive too. The third reason is that Aedes pupae can be easily removed, returned to the laboratory and identified to species when they emerge as adults. And lastly, counting pupae, like counting larvae, allows comparisons to be made regarding the productivity of different types of containers. The number of Aedes aegypti pupae per person is used in transmission simulation models of dengue to determine risk thresholds and can be used to target strategies aimed at containers. For example, this table provides survey results from five locations and estimates of transmission thresholds. Under the targeted column are the proportions of containers that need to be controlled or eliminated if the program focuses only on the most productive containers in the environment. Please refer to the original source for information, Fox paper in, published in 2003, because it provides more information. But it is evident that a strategic targeted approach requires less resources than a program that is not targeted. However, currently there is no information on how pupil indices correlate with um, chikungunya or Zika transmission. Lastly, we will deal with the last stage of the life cycle, which are eggs. Now, overtraps exploit the tendency of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus females to lay their eggs in artificial containers. Overtraps are basically artificial overposition sites and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Generally, they are small containers, usually dark in colour, that contain water and a rough substrate such as wood, cloth or cardboard for the female mosquitoes to lay their eggs. The typical overtrap shown here is a plastic water-filled container with a cardboard paddle that serves as the preferred rough substrate for the female to lay her eggs. The paddle is longer than the container, so it can be picked up and removed without rubbing off any eggs that have been laid. Usually, only presence or absence is recorded, but the number of eggs can also be counted if required. Overtraps are normally placed in shaded areas, which are the preferred breeding sites of mosquitoes, and at selected sites where they will encounter minimal disturbance from people. Several attempts have been made to increase their sensitivity, such as using different colours or types of substrates and using different chemical attraction. For example, hay infusion is often used. They are usually monitored once a week before any laid eggs develop into adults. They are inexpensive, easily deployed and are not invasive. Typically, only one overtrap is placed per city block. However, interpreting overtrap data requires caution. 
other traps compete with naturally occurring larval habitats, and they may not accurately reflect the abundance of gravid females. They are used to gather data on the spatial and temporal distributions of Aedes aegypti and to quantify the impact of interventions aimed at containers. They should not be used as a proxy for adult densities. In addition to monitoring and surveillance affected populations, they can be used as lethal over traps when an insecticide is used with the bait for control.